Well, good evening and welcome to the first of the Ian Ramsey Centre seminars for Hillary Term 2014 at Trinity College, Oxford. The title of the seminar this evening is New Frontiers of the Origins of Life, Atacama Desert and Astrobiology. Our speaker this evening is Professor Rafael Vicuña, and Professor Vicuña studied biochemistry at the University of Chile in Santiago, where he received his undergraduate degree in 1972. Then he obtained his master's and PhD degrees in molecular biology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He's pre presently a full professor at the Faculty of Biological Sciences, the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile in Santiago, where he has formerly been vice president for academic affairs and dean of his faculty. For those who don't already know this, uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile is one of the two top rated universities in the whole of Latin America. He's a member of the Chilean Academy of Sciences, the Latin American Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. He's published around 100 papers in the fields of enzymology and the regulation of gene expression in bacteria and fungi, and around 50 papers dealing with either science and religion or science and society. Please would you welcome Professor Vicuña. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Andrew. Good evening, everyone. Well, I would like to start by thanking Andrew Vincent and Ignacio Silva for the kind invitation to come to Oxford and give this seminar. I was here a few months ago, and I would never have thought that in, a few short, in such a short time I would be back in this uh, beautiful place uh, giving, talking about my, my own work. And I don't have exactly the same title that Andrew Pinsett uh, said to you, but well, if I will talk about the microbial biodiversity in the hyperarid Atacama Desert. This is a research project that uh, we started about five years ago with the main objective of uh, trying to understand how is it that bacteria and, and fungi, uh, microorganisms in general, uh, adapt to live in an environment where is, there is virtually no water. And... Uh, the, the Atacama Desert, you, you, you have, can we turn off the light of this, uh, this uh, part? Or, because otherwise you will see much less. Is, is it not possible? It's quite visible from here. Okay, good, good. So this is a photo taken by myself. Uh, the, the Atacama Desert is a very unique setting, as I'm going to show you. <coughs> oh, I don't have it. Well, uh, it extends across 1,000 kilometers in northern Chile. There is a map with the countries on top, but... The desert is in that square there, uh, uh, between uh, 30 degrees south and 20 degrees south uh, along the Pacific coast in northern Chile. It is the driest, that, that is no question about it, it is the driest desert on earth, and it is probably the oldest desert on earth. That is more controversial, but it is, anyway, it is very old. And it can be segmented in regions that differ in, in relative humidity, that go from semi-humid to semi-arid, arid, and hyper-arid. It is a very desolate uh, landscape, as you may see. Oh, no, well, before I, I show you a, a photo, this is how you see the Atacama Desert from, from space. This is a very common view uh, of the Atacama Desert. So you see uh, clouds on, to the east and clouds to the west, and you never see clouds on top of the desert. And, and I am pointing here, I'm showing here two telescopes. You know that the Atacama Desert is a very suitable place to have telescopes. And this, these are the two largest, two of the largest telescope facilities we have in, in northern Chile, the ALMA telescope and the VLT. So they, there are no clouds. And how can this be? Well, this is a, this is a, a, a cartoon that I uh, took from a, a paper by McKay uh, that shows a cross-section of the Atacama Desert. So to the right, you have the, the Andes Mountains, which block any rain coming from the east and then in the middle, you have the Domeco Mountains, which uh, uh, block runoff from the Andes. Then to, to the east, next, next to the ocean, you have the coastal mountains, uh, which uh, block coastal fox, uh, fox coming into, into inland. And then we have a very cold current coming from the south, the Humboldt Current, which prevents precipitation in the coastal region. So, this end up, ends up in a, in a very dry core desert, which we call the, the hyperarid desert, that has some, some of the following characteristics. This is, this is a photo taken by, by myself also. 
to get a sense of the scale of the landscape, you can see one of my students here, standing here. <laughs> okay. Usually in deserts you see small plants and trees. Here you see nothing. It's actually, this photo is very similar to the photos sent by the rovers from Mars, you see. We will be talking about that. Uh, these are some of the properties of the hyper arid region. The humidity varies daily between zero and 50%. Zero would be, I would say, 4 p.m. at 5 p.m. every day and 50% uh, uh, at dawn in the sunrise. Then almost complete absence of rains. There are places where after years and years of recording, they never uh, detect any rain. The temperature varies between zero and 30 degrees. It is not too hot, perhaps due to the Humboldt current. High solar radiation, and you have to keep this in mind, please, because we always think of the main hazard for, for microorganisms is the dryness, but also radiation. The soils are very saline. They have uh, many ions, nitrate, sulfate, carbonate. Usually, this these uh, ions are metabolized by microorganisms. That's why you don't see high concentrations of, of them in, in normal soils. But since there are, as I'm, I'm going to show you, very few microorganisms in this uh, place, uh, these uh, salts accumulate. And the soils are, also have other characteristics. Uh, for example, low level of organics to compare, for example, the total organic content of this desert, which would be 600 micrograms per gram, as compared to Sahara, Sahara Desert, 1,700, and Mojave, 7,000. So there's very low levels of organics. And then non-specific chemical oxidants. This is important because when you want to detect organic matter, if you have oxidants, it will get oxidized and you don't see any organic matter. So these two properties, the low levels of organics and non-specific chemical oxidants, were found to be very similar to the properties of Mars soils. Uh, this, uh, what, what I showed you before, was published in this landmark paper by, by McKay's group, Christopher McKay's group, uh, about 10 years ago only. Mars-like soils in the Atacama Desert, Chile, and the dry limit of microbial life. Everybody knows about this paper, OK? What they found here is that the soils are very similar in terms of chemical composition, and the, the chemical compositions of the soils in Mars were analyzed by the Viking missions uh, several years ago. And in addition to the properties of the soils, they found that samples from this region had organic species only at the trace level, and extremely low levels of cultural bacteria. In addition, two samples from the extreme arid regions were tested for DNA, and none was recovered. This is very unusual. You take soil from anywhere, and you have lots of DNA. But there is no DNA in, in this sample. OK, let's see. I will, I will be careful. OK. As I said, this, this is a, was a very important paper. It didn't go unnoticed to the press. There was a press release by CNN that I want to show you. And let me take some time, OK? Digging for life in the deadest desert, driest spot on Earth may hold clues to Mars. Uh, Chris McKay was interviewed. I will show you what he said later. But this is important to keep in mind. Specialized microorganisms called extremophiles thrive in nuclear waste, volcanic vents, boiling hill thermal geysers, and even deep inside rocks. Their unique biology allows them to feast on chemicals and radiation that would kill most organisms. But there is a place on Earth so hostile to life that even extremophile perish, Chile's Atacama Desert. This was 10 years ago. Here is the only place where we have really crossed a threshold where we find no life, says Chris McKay. Chris McKay is a big shot in astrobiology. <clears throat> we, are, we are talking about the, the, the Atacama Desert being a, a model for Mars. And I want you to be aware, most of you must be, that the current issue of science, the one that was published, released on uh, the 24th of January, is, has a dossier on, on Mars. With all these articles, it, it, it's in the cover also, exploring Martian habitability. There, these are the titles of some of the articles in the current issue of Science. And these articles altogether were, were commented by one of the authors of this paper. And I took a sentence from, from his, his comment. It says there, these results demonstrate that early Mars was habitable, but this does not mean that Mars was inhabited. Okay, that, that, is, that is the summary. 
uh, of, of all these articles. So but by today, we can, we can say that there is a possibility that there was life uh, on Mars uh, millions of years ago. OK, going back to the Atacama Desert, 10 years ago, McKay didn't find any life, a few, very few uh, cultural microorganisms. But since then, people have learned how to look for, for <coughs> niches or habitats to find microorganisms. For example, soils. But you cannot look above the soil, as he did. You have to dig a hole and, and look underneath because there is too much radiation on top. Halides. Halides are rocks made of sodium chloride. And sodium chloride has the property of, it's an hygroscopic substance, it attracts water. So the microorganisms make use of this property of salt to grow inside the rocks. So you, you, you walk in the Atacama Desert, you see a rock and you crunch the rock and inside you see the bacteria growing. It's, it's amazing. These are quartz rocks, these are translucent stones. And of course, the bugs cannot live inside because it's, it's a solid rock. They cannot live on top because of the radiation. They, they live underneath the rock, the rock. They form a biofilm in the underside of the rock. And so the rock is translucent. It, it, um, some, some small per percentage of the light manages to go through, and all the microorganisms under, underneath the rock can live on that light. With a, uh, based on photosynthesis, of course. I will be coming back to this. And then caves, of course. There are some caves in the Atacama Desert. There are some caves in Mars also. So people think that these pl places are more protected against radiation, against uh, high temperature fl fluctuations. So we have, in our lab, explored some of these niches. And we have isolated microorganisms for, from all of them. I will start by referring uh, to a very simple work that we did just to prove that there are microorganisms growing underneath the, the surface of the soil. Um, this is, a, this is a, a work that we conducted in collaboration with a Bra Brazilian group. Uh, so we, we isolated uh, soil, I mean, we, we isolated samples five centimeters below the surface, and we, we suspended this uh, soil in, in culture media, and then we diluted the, the, the growing uh, cultures, and we could isolate individual bacteria. All of them are pigmented. And pigments, you know, protect against UV radiation. That, that was the idea, to isolate, since they are so close to the surface, to isolate bacteria that will be highly resistant to, to radiation. And we isolate many, many bacteria in, in different media, and we uh, subjected to, to a high dose of UV radiation, and this shows uh, the survival, percent survival of, of, of some of them, not percent, but the survival fraction, I would say, because this is a logarithmic scale. So we go from, from 10% here to, to, to completely sensitive to the dosage that is shown on top. Uh, in any event, you can tell immediately that, that all these bacteria are much more resistant than regular bacteria to UV radiation. And we compared uh, uh, one of the most resistant strains that we isolated, this one here. And we compared the survival rate to the same UV dosage uh, with Echerichia colis, a common bacterium that has no reason to be UV sensitive, and to a very resistant uh, strain uh, uh, to, to UV radiation, as it is uh, Dinococcus radiodurans. This, that is the most resistant bacteria that we know of uh, in terms of resistance to radiation and to UV uh, irradiation. Um, so, as you can see, E. coli is much more sensitive, uh, at least tenfold more sensitive than, than our strain, and in, in, in also our strain is much more sensitive than Dinococcus radiodurans. But in, a general, uh, in, in general, we can say that our strains that we isolated from this uh, place in the desert are quite resistant to UV radiation. OK, we'll now move to a different uh, habitat, a cave. This cave is near the coast. Uh, it's, the cave is about 30 meters deep and uh, 6 meters wide. Um, if you walk inside the cave, everything looks fine. And suddenly, about 20 meters inside the cave, you start looking at a very uh, green color in the wall. It's a pity that the, the, the contrast of the light is not so high, but 
This. Oh, they are filming. They are filming. Yeah, they are filming. You're right. You're right. Okay, but you will believe me. This is a this is a emerald color that develops on the in the western side of, of the cave, not in the eastern side of, of the cave. <clears throat> we measured uh, the intensity, the light, uh, the intensity of the light. Uh, the technical term is uh, photosynthetic photon flux density because we measured the intensity of the light in the wavelength range that is used to, to, for doing photosynthesis. And I circle here in red the distance from the entrance where the film uh, in the wall develops best. And it, it, it's only, as I said, in the western wall here. And the amount of light is very, very low here. Uh, there is hardly no light, but perhaps this is the, the amount of light that this, whatever, I, I'm going to show you what it is, this whatever microorganism likes to, to do photosynthesis on, very, very low levels of light, 0.18%. Perhaps a higher intensity would be too stressful for this uh, microorganism. So we suspended this biofilm in, in, in growth media. And this is a photo, it's a, it's a merge of a, a interfer differential interfering contrast image, uh, optical microscopy, of course, with a confocal laser microscopy. And the laser elicits um, the production of uh, fluorescence from the pigments here. And as you can see, it, first of all, it looks to be a very homogeneous uh, population. Uh, there seems to be only a single microorganism there. And also, th there are uh, photosynthetic pigments inside, which is not, doesn't come as a surprise because the, they are green, uh, the, the, the biofilm is green, it's, it's the only way to, to get some, some nutrients uh, through photosynthesis. Nothing is feeding this uh, biofilm in the cell wall. We did uh, characterization using electron microscopy and we found a very large chloroplast where photosynthesis takes place with all the tilacoidal membranes. And this is a single chloroplast. This is very unusual in, in this. Uh, for example, in a cell from a plant, you will see many, many chloroplasts. This, uh, this microorganism has a single chloroplast, a nucleus, a single mitochondria also. Uh, it has a very thick uh, cell wall, which is very common in, in microorganisms that grow in dry environments because this, uh, this is an extra polysaccharide that attracts water and um, keeps the water inside of the cell. So it's a kind of protection that they have to, 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 to trap water. Uh, there is a dividing cell to your right. To characterize further this uh, microorganism that is growing in the cell wall of this cave, we did a phylogenetic analysis. And it groups very clearly in, uh, with other uh, microalga that, that are called cyanidium. cyanidium and very close to other two cyanidium that were isolated in Italy, and they also grow in caves. That's a coincidence. So this is, this is a microalga then. It's not a bacteria. And it grows by itself in the cell wall, inside the cave. Then we went to another cave. And that, this was a different cave. It was less humid. And we also saw a green color in the wall, and we thought it could have been the same uh, uh, microorganism. But when we approached the wall, we noticed that it wasn't a biofilm. It was something <laughs> growing on a spider web. And we took photos of spider webs, and we, we, we realized something that you have, you have seen, I am sure, that the, the spider webs, uh, they, they, attract, they trap water. They trap the moisture. So you, you see uh, water drops in the, in, the, in the threads of a spider web. So that is the strategy that this green something is using to, to get water. OK? This is a, the uh, photo taken using an optical microscopy. Again, it it's seems to be a single microorganism. It's very green. This is a photo taken using scanning electron microscopy. We immediately did uh, phylogenetic analysis. It, it has nothing to do with, uh, with a cyanidium. It turned out to be a dunaliella. Dunaliella is a well-known unicellular alga that grows in liquid, of course. And we did uh, 
phylogenetic analysis with two genes, a genes from the photosynthetic apparatus, and again the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And in both cases, it is clear it is a Dunaliela. Dunaliela, you may be familiar with it because it is used a lot in cosmetics. It's very rich in pigments, very rich in, in beta carotene. It's good for the skin. So in this case, they are describing Dunaliela. That's the only, uh, is the only organism that grows in the Dead Sea <laughs> because it's too salty, the Dead Sea. So you find it in, in cosmetic products. This again is a photo uh, emerging of uh, interference with uh, differential interference with uh, laser microscopy. And again, we see the cell filled with, uh, with pigments, with the dark spot uh, in the center. Then I will show you later what it is, actually in the next, fo in the next uh, photo. This is a, an electron photomicrograph. And we see a large, very large chloroplast, again, a single chloroplast, which is common in Dunaliela strains. And this, uh, the dark uh, spot that we saw in the previous photo, it turns out to be a, a micro compartment called a pyrenoid. Pyrenoid is a, a concentration of the photosynthetic enzymes that makes the photosynthesis pro, uh, process more efficient. And the, the white stuff around the pyrenoid inside the chloroplast is starch. And this is a photo of a single cell with a, Dunaliella usually have a flagella because you know the flagella help them to swim. And our our Dunaliella doesn't have a flagella but has two two structures that are reminiscent of flagella. We call them stab like structures. And we believe that these are helping the, the cells to, to attach to the to the thread of, of the spider web. OK, we published this in, in a journal called Extremophiles. And uh, it has been a very popular paper to find, to find this you know, a microorganism that grows in the desert in the threads of the spider web. OK, this is another habitat. Uh, I, I talked to you before about the quart rocks. Uh, there are very few places in the desert where you find this, uh, these rocks, uh, these transparent rocks. Now you lift you lift a rock from the, from the ground and you see this this yellow this sorry this green color you see these are cyanobacteria growing there and where do, does the water come from it comes from the fog that comes in every evening from the coast that is the only source of water so we placed some sensors we studied the habitat where this biofilm is developing underneath this rock. So we placed uh, uh, sensors for temperature and relative humidity. I will show you temperature, recordings of temperature on top of the stone of the rock, below, underneath where the biofilm is developing, on the ground surface, and we dug a small hole at the same uh, uh, deepness than, than the one that, where the film is developing, and we recorded temperature. And there are fluctuations every day. And, I can tell you, it's easier for me to tell you than for you to see, that uh, during the day, below the stone, the temperature is lower. And during the night, the temperature, the temperature is higher than outside the rock. So it's a kind of protected environment. We also placed some uh, light sensors below the rock to see how much of the incoming light on top of the rock was passing through, which is the light that is being used for uh, doing photosynthesis. And it goes from 3%, 4%, 1%. And that is enough for uh, cyanobacteria that are growing underneath the rock to do photosynthesis and, as I will show you, to support the growth of many more bacteria there. So we studied the composition of this biofilm. And instead, as opposed to the case where the, the cave, for example, where the biofilm was mainly one single organism, in this case, we found a zoo of microorganisms. This is a fluorescence uh, uh, photograph taken uh, using uh, op um, optical microscopy. And as you can see by the morphology, there are uh, several types of, of, of bacteria there. And since they fluoresce, all of these are cyanobacteria, bacteria that can uh, do photosynthesis. 
And then using phylogenetic analysis, we isolate the ribosomal RNA from, from, the, from the mixture, and we analyze them using the proper softwares. And we found that the community inside these rocks uh, was composed of 41 species of bacteria, 11 species of cyanobacteria, 12 species of archaea, and two, two microalgae. So you have uh, many, many microorganisms growing just with the fog that is coming from the coastal mountain and light. These microorganisms are making biomolecules, fixing CO2 uh, uh, through the photosynthetic process, and fixing nitrogen to ammonia from, from the atmospheric nitrogen also. So they provide themselves with all the nutrients. And they need each other. It is very difficult to isolate these organisms one from each other because one will provide the rest with a nutrient, the other one will, etc. But the entire community is relying on the capacity of cyanobacteria to fix CO2 and nitrogen. Okay, and as I told you in the beginning, our main objective is to study at the molecular level and at the morphological level what are the adaptations that allow these bacteria to grow under these conditions. So we had to select a model, and we decided to isolate from this community a single cyanobacterium. So we suspended the biofilm in water and started with classical microbiological techniques. And this is a gel that shows that, uh, I can tell you the details if you want, they were originally, at this stage of the isolation, five uh, different types of cyanobacteria, and when we ended, we had a single cyanobacteria. The culture is still not axenic. Axenic means pure. It, is, it has been very difficult, and we know the reason, to isolate our cyanobacteria free of, the, of a few other microorganisms uh, keep uh, sticking to it. But uh, that's, that's, that, that is not a problem for the kind of studies that we are developing. This is a suspension of our cyanobacteria. So when we grow it, in liquid cultures, it grows, of course, uh, with a green color. This is an electron micrograph of, of, of these uh, cyanobacteria. It usually grows in tetrads, as you can see there, four cells. And this is very common. It has been described for a species called Crococidiopsis. But we also see sometimes uh, binary groups, like here, uh, and also single cells. And, and you, see two sing you see in this photo two single cells, one with a thick uh, exopolysaccharide layer and another one that is, doesn't, doesn't have any, any polysaccharide, uh, exopolysaccharide layer. Perhaps it has been recently released from a tetrad, and that's why you don't see the exopolysaccharide. When we want to use a phylogenetic analysis to classify our strain, uh, in our first approach, it turned out to be a, a crop, sorry, a crococidiopsis strain with a sequence that we had available, this was two years ago, we thought it was a crococidiopsis, and uh, the phylogenetic analysis coincides with the morphologic analysis. Today, morphology has been the main criterion to classify cyanobacteria, so we were pretty happy with this, but more and more sequences from cyanobacteria are becoming available, so we used more sequences for our phylogenetic analysis, uh, I will skip this. And in fact, sorry, you will not see anything from there, but I just believe what I say. Uh, it groups very close to a gle gleocapsa, okay? So, and all the crococidiopsis are here, are in red. These two are not crococidiopsis. So we have to refine our study to confirm that it is a gleocapsopsis instead of a crococidiopsis. And if I could spend hours explaining you this uh, phylogenetic tree because there are some crococidiopsis strain on this side that I think that they're misplaced there. They were classified based on morphology and not based on uh, genetic analysis. So it, it is a problem today, uh, uh, and I am aware of it because uh, there, there are lots of papers on this, on the criteria to classify cyanobacteria. But we are pretty sure now that we have a gleocapsopsis and we recently published it as, as, as such. Well, what I skipped before, this is a, just a map of the world that I took from a paper by Ball, published in, in Nature, that shows 
uh, where, uh, where cro crocosidopsis has been found and in all types of desert, in, in hot deserts and cold deserts. So when we originally classified our strain as a crocosidopsis, it didn't surprise us because crocosidopsis is a desert strain. But it is not a crocosidopsis, it's gleocapsosis that also grows in tetrads. Some uh, further characterization using the electron microscope, again a thick, a thick uh, wall, uh, EPS, the nucleoid where the uh, nucleic acids are, the thylakoidal membranes, membranes around the cell, you see where photosynthesis takes place. This, here is a dividing cell, you can see that the cell is divided, there is an enlargement here. What else? Uh, sometimes you see colonies with more than, than, than four strains, than four cells, as, as in this case. And sometimes, for example, late in cultures, you see single cells. These are more, more features that I would like to show you. For example, the carboxysome, it's a polyedrical uh, micro compartment that similar to the pyranoid in the sense that it concentrates uh, the uh, enzymes that participate in, in photosynthesis. These are polyphosphates uh, which accumulate late in cultures. These are polyhydroxyalkanoid, these are, these are the names, sorry, which is a carbon source that also accumulates uh, when the nutrients are, are scarce, okay? But these are photos taken from uh, liquid cultures. So we had to devise an assay to measure uh, response to low water availability, uh, to, to measure the effect of desiccation. And we, we devised an assay because there are so many papers describing uh, desiccation of cells, but it, there is not a universal assay. So different people desiccate cells in different ways. So when you want to compare your results with those obtained by other groups, it's not possible. They, they use different conditions. So we decided to offer the world a, a new assay so we can all reproduce the, uh, the, 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 the assay. And it's, it is very simple. It is a Petri dish with a desiccating agent inside. And this is a slide, a glass slide, where we put some, a few drops of the culture on top. And then we, we, we have a, a sensor for relative humidity on the, on the lid of the, of, the, of the Petri dish. And then this is the recording of the, the relative humidity inside. First, it goes up, of course, because all the water begins to, to evaporate from the slide. And then it's, it is captured by the hygroscopic agent. And it, it levels off after, the, I would say, the third day. After the third day, no matter what final relative humidity you want to have, and that will depend on the amount of hygroscopic agent that you add, it will level off, as, as you can see. So you, ca you can reproduce these assays and, and see, OK, what do I want to do? What do I want to do in this assay? For here you have the liquid culture. You have different plates. So you desiccate them, say, for one week, for two weeks, for any period that you want. And then you determine whatever you want to measure. For example, survival rates. OK, if I desiccate cells for one month, for example, how many of them will be alive if I rehydrate them, if I add water at the end of the mass. We, we, we can follow changes in morphology, accumulation of compatible solutes, fatty acid composition. Th there are reasons for this, OK? Uh, I don't have time to go through all the studies that we have made. I will be selective. But of course, the lipids, li lipids are important in the response of the cells to desiccation. Dehydrins, I will be not talking about dehydrins unless you ask. But dehydrins are proteins produced by plants when there is drought. If, 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 if plants are short of water, they produce these proteins that protect their cells. Uh, gene expression studies, which is very difficult. I will not talk about gene expression studies, although we have done some. Because you have to keep in mind that we have to isolate messenger RNA from desiccated cells. That had never been done before. So we had to devise a protocol to isolate mRNA and to characterize the mRNA and study gene expression to see what type of metabolism is taking place in desiccated cells. The cells are desiccated. There is no water there. I mean, no water to our senses because there, there is some water, but inside the cells. Uh, 
I can tell you much more about studies on gene expression because we wanted to, be, to have the most original of our contributions in this field, but it has become very difficult, to, first of all, to isolate the RNA and then to have a control. If you are working with liquid cultures and you, you may say, for example, okay, you, I, I'm going to determine the effect of this chemical. So you add the chemical and you compare cells in the liquid culture that don't have the chemical with cells in the liquid culture that have the chemical. So you have a control. But in the desiccated cells, you don't have a control. It's a headache. It's a problem. So I will refer to survival rates, for example. So may I, you may ask the question, OK, after I desiccate the cells, how many of them remain alive? <clears throat> and we have a test for this, which is based in, in fluorescence. Because one dye, the green dye, finds its way inside the cells, live cells and dead cells. And the red dye can enter the cells only when they are dead, masking the green color. So when you see red cells, and this is a control, we boil this, uh, this sample so we have a positive control. These are all dead cells, and these are all live cells. But when you see an actual sample, you see many green cells and some red cells. And you can count, you have to count, <laughs> play some music while you count, and then you, you calculate, and to make the long story short, I will show you in this case, for example, that after 20 days, at 41% relative humidity, 73% of the cells are, t are still alive. So they recover themselves, not only based on, on this test, but when you add water, they recover themselves. After two years, at 43% relative humidity, two years with no water, 70% are still alive. So this is, this is one, one type of study that we're conducting, and the different final uh, desiccation conditions, what, what are the rates of survival. We are doing some morphological studies on desiccated cells. First of all, we, we have, instead of one carboxysome, desiccated cells have several carboxysomes. The cell wall is much thicker. The, the, the telacoidal membranes become disorganized. You cannot see the details, but they, they leave the periphery of the cells and they distribute throughout the cell. And also there are many vesicles. We notice that desiccated cells begin to produce vesicles. And this is a further detail on the production of vesicles. And you, these two squares here are amplified here. And believe me, there are many, many vesicles being produced in desiccated cells. And we were very excited. We don't know the meaning of this. But you know, two weeks ago, only two weeks ago, this paper was published in Nature. And it's a big finding, such a big finding, that it received a comment. And I am reproducing a photo, not from the paper, but from the comment in Science. This was published on the 10th of January, a few, few, few days ago. So this is cyanobacteria from the ocean. And you can see the tilacoidal membranes in this cartoon. And they, they found that this uh, cyanobacterium produces a lot of, of vesicles. And they analyzed the vesicles. And they found, first of all, that they contain DNA. So it, this may be a way for lateral transfer of DNA. They also found that they contain, they are very rich in ca carbon compounds. This could be a way of this cyanobacteria to support other organisms providing them with key uh, carbon compounds, and in turn, I am sure the other microorganisms will, will help this cyanobacterium with some vitamins or whatever. Otherwise, they, I don't think it would be feeding other organisms. And then the third purpose of these uh, vesicles is to serve as decoy for vi uh, against viral infection. Because, of course, the, the, the vesicles have the same uh, membrane receptors as the main cell, so the, the, the virus the viruses attached to the vesicles instead of, of the main cell. So this is a, this is a, an ongoing uh, I mean, uh, subject, and we are eager to, to, to learn more about the production of vesicles. This is something else. I told you about compatible solutes. These are sugars that are produced. This is not uh, something very original, but we know that we determined them we, we also find this uh, phenomenon in, in our bacterium. Once the cell is desiccated, it starts producing sugars, sucrose and trehalose. 
And the idea is to increase the osmotic pressure inside the cell to retain more water. And it is, this is a strategy that has been found for other microorganisms before. But the point here is, you see, these cells are desiccated. And while they are desiccated, they are producing vesicles, they are rearranging the telecoidal membranes, they are making the exopolysaccharide uh, warm thicker, they are, they are producing sugars. <laughs> there are a lot of things taking place in cells that you could perfectly say they are inactive, they are dormant, what, whatever word you want to use. This is, this is the metabolic uh, pathway to produce sucrose, and I am showing it to you. I will not show you the pathway for trehalose, which is much more complicated, just to show you that we isolated the two genes to do phylogenetic studies, and again, luckily for us, the, the, according to this criteria now, not the 16 sRNA, but the, the genes involved in sucrose biosynthesis, uh, the, our isolate uh, groups next to gliocapsopsis for the two genes. Okay, and I'm coming to, to approaching the end, uh, so I would like to end with some general concepts. For example, in environments where there is no liquid water, like the hyperarid zones in deserts, the dry valleys in Antarctica, I haven't referred to the other model of Mars on Earth, which are the dry valleys. In the Antarctica, there are these so-called valleys where there is never liquid water. There is no liquid water, they have either ice or nothing. So they, there are microorganisms there that try to thrive uh, as in the Atacama Desert with no liquid water, and they have different strategies to obtain it from the ambient moisture. The question is now, what is the minimum amount of water required for microbial life? What kind of metabolism is taking place in desiccated cells? I mentioned some, of, some processes that are taking place in, in cells that are desiccated. And the question for, for these organisms that we have isolated from the Atacama is, did they evolve to be less dependent on water? Have they been there forever in the Atacama Desert, or they recently colonized the desert coming from, from some other place, from the ocean, for example. With respect to the first question, what is the minimum amount of water? Well, you have to look in the driest place. <laughs> and I have been talking about the Atacama Desert, but most of the hyperarid of the Atacama that has been explored is near a place called Yungay. And the first determinations made by NASA researchers were, uh, were sh showed that Yungay was the driest place. But other people have been doing determinations in other places. Our own group has been doing so. And we found a, a, a place called Maria Elena, which is, looks to be, according to what our sensors of relative humidity say, much drier than Yungay. So we have been isolating. This is a landscape. These are two of my students there. Uh, we dug a hole, a one meter deep hole, and we took samples every 20 centimeters and we did determinations of temperature and, and, and humidity. And of course, on top, you see lots of variation in both uh, as you approach the, the bottom of the hole, one, one meter deep, the, the, there is no variation either in temperature or relative humidity. But the relative humidity in the uh, one meter deep is, is almost nothing. It's almost, let's see, this is relative humidity, it's, it's 15%. It's the least you can find. And we ask the question, are, are there microorganisms there? And there are. And we are in the process of characterizing them even one meter deep, you find. This is the very driest place on Earth. <laughs> there are no nutrients, there is no water, there is no fog. And there are, there are bacteria. And these are bacteria that grow. You know that you can, people say that you can grow in the lab 0.1%, 0.1% of the microorganisms that are around. We, we don't know how to grow them all. Uh, and there are re different reasons why, in, in spite of adding nutrients to a broth, you don't get the bacteria to grow. But only 0.1% of bacteria grow. And we still see many with our eyes. And there are other ways to reveal the microorganisms that are growing there using very fine uh, genetic methods. It's called metagenomics. And of course, we, we may very well do that. So we are in the process of characterizing these cells. I am, let me show you this about, I, I want to refer now to the other question. What, 
what kind of metabolism is taking place in these cells. But if you were amazed, I hope, with the results we obtained in terms of activities taking place in desiccated cells, look at this paper that was published, I think, two or three years ago in PNAS. This has to do with regeneration of a plant. Regeneration of whole plants from 30,000 year old fruit tissue that had been frozen. 30,000 years, frozen during 30,000 years. And this research group was able to, to recover that, that plant. But look at this one. This was published in Nature. Isolation of a 250 million year old halotolerant bacterium from a primary salt crystal. It, it was published in Nature, so it, it's good enough to go the scrutiny of, of, of reviewers. So you ask yourself, so, so what is life then? This bacterium has been there for 250 million with no nutrient just standing there, dormant, and you are able to recover it. It's a mystery. And with respect to the question whether our organisms, that the one that at least I talked to you about, are originally from the desert or they came recently, we have some arguments. For example, the species more closely related to Cyanidium, Dunaliella, and Gleocapsopsis, isolated by our group, are aquatic species. So they most likely came from the ocean. Dunaliella shows some phenotypic traits like a pyrenoid. I can give you arguments why, why a, 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 an, algae that grow, an algae that grows in, the, in, 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 in liquid water requires a pyrenoid, but you don't expect an aerial alga to need a pyrenoid, and I can give you the reasons later, but it has a pyrenoid, which shows that perhaps it came to land recently, and it also has these flagella-like stubs uh, that may, there, they may be mutants from a flagella, perhaps, and also the ability of their corresponding ancestors to proliferate in the salty environment, the ancestors of our uh, organisms and the, the relatives that are aquatic species, they, they, they come from, from salty water. And you know, when you, when you have a, a, a growth medium with high concentration of salt, the availability, the availability of water decreases. The, we say the activity of water decreases. So one of the ways to test a tolerance to, to, to dryness is to increase the salt concentration in, the broth, in liquid culture, for example, because the mechanisms are the same to, to respond to that stress. Um, okay, end up with a photo of, of the group. There are two graduate students, Armando and Catalina. You know Catalina, Andrew? Yes. <laughs> uh, then three undergraduate, they, are, they, all, they all received their degrees already, Christian, Luis, and uh, Brigitte from Panama. Then my technician, Loreto, and myself. And I will be glad to answer questions. I'm sure there are many questions. Thank you. We have up to uh, half an hour for questions. And um, what I'd ask you to do is just, just raise your hand, and I'll try to get you to in the right order. And if you'd just like to wait for... Um, Ignacio, to come out with a microphone, we'll be able to, to catch your question as well. Thank you. It's a slight slide track from Atacama, but the marine organisms you mentioned with the vesicles budding off, mm -hmm. I had heard that there are several hypotheses about what these vesicles might be for. But has anybody actually tracked the free-floating vesicles to discover what becomes of them? No, no, they just had the results of the, the, their analysis. You see, they had just realized that they have DNA, they have carbon compounds, nutrients, and they are, quote-unquote, infected by, by viruses. It's a, it's a very recent finding. Yeah. But, but no, it's, a, it's an open right. field, you know, these vesicles. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Raphael, I love these results and these <laughs> pictures and these data, so thank, thank you. you very much. To what extent...
can we determine the extent to which extremophiles have already explored the whole range of possible environments for life. So what I mean by that is this. There are some one-dimensional scales. One of the ones that's prevalent here is the range of humidity, minimum, mm -hmm. maximum humidity. Temperature, minimum temperature, maximum. Uh, pH, minimum pH, <coughs> maximum pH. Pressure. And no, pressure, uh, acidity well. and alkalinity. Oh, I know, but not. other extremes. Could be pressure. Yeah. And then there are some others which are a bit more open-ended, like the range of foodstuffs that might be available mm. that they could feed on. And for each of these, I imagine you could put limits as to what life has actually been found. And so my question is, is that because that's just the range of environments that life has been able to explore on Earth? Or is it, in fact that for some or all of these, a wider range of environments has been found, uh, is available, and therefore the range that's been found really does seem to represent the maximum range in mm -hmm. which life is possible. <laughs> which brings us to the subject of, of what is life. Indeed. Because, because there is so, we know of one type of life, and for several physical, chemical reasons, there, there are limits. There is a limiting the temperature, which has to be at high pressure, otherwise the water will be boiling, and in pH, and there, there are physical, chemical reasons for, for these limits. But this is for the type of life that we know of, and it is possible that there is other type of life, and then we have to discuss what do you mean by other type of life? <laughs> and we will have many answers in this room, I am sure, but well, then to it, me, it, to, to it, me, it would be speaking in, in biological terms, of physical, chemical terms, and in an auto uh, sustainable uh, entity, uh, far from equilibrium. So, if we take that definition of life, what would the answer to my question be? I, I think that by now we have explored all the all the environments for life as we know it, including the hydrothermal vents. And we, we already have the, the limits. I don't think they will vary much. I don't see there is any room to, to enlarge those limits, to extend those limits. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, and it's highly relevant in the context of theories that talk about the constraints on the possibilities for evolution. So if, if you think that there are some fundamental limits, at least for life as we now know it, mm -hmm. and that those have been fully explored, then you might conclude that evolution is constrained within those limits. And so the possibilities for evolutionary development have to lie within that envelope, much of which may already have been explored by evolutionary processes, though not, possibly not all of it. But you see that there, are not, there aren't too many environments on Earth that are lifeless. I mean, you go to, to the ocean, for example, to the bottom of the ocean, and you dig a deep hole in the ocean, in the deep ocean, you still find organisms. Um, there have been organisms isolated from gold mines in South Africa that are 1,000 meters deep. So the, I think that we, I don't see, there, there isn't any inhabited place on Earth, I think. Well, then that would give the opposite answer to my question. That would say no the limits that have been found are just because that's the limits of the environments that are available, happen to be available on Earth. Yes, yeah, and the question would be if, uh, if the conditions were different, as they were originally on, in the early Earth, mm -hmm. there were different types of uh, organisms. I mean, bacteria have been around for so, four billion years, and the conditions are, were completely different. There was no oxygen, the temperature was different, the nutrients were different. And there were, there were bacteria growing. So then, then you would get, reach the opposite conclusion, which is that the limits that we found are not constrained by any fundamental limits, but simply by the happenstance of the limited For, range of environments 
on Earth that... Well, there are, physical, there are physical chemical reasons to have limits, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to keep the two strands of DNA together. Yeah. And you can get around of it with proteins that will keep them together, or, but then the protein will denature at higher temperatures or at a different pH. I think that we have found now that the, the window is quite, uh, you know, the window for life uh, in terms of environments is quite uh, open and wide, you know. Mm. We would never have imagined that there were, you know, so many organisms in the hydrothermal vents, for example, which are completely independent of the, of the rest of the ecosystems. They support themselves uh, in the with the nutrients that they, they do photosynthesis there with the, with, the, with the light of produced by the magma. And they support themselves in the deep ocean. And the, there are eukaryotes growing there, crabs, worms. It's amazing. I mean, I, if you are in those limits, which can be very extreme, you, you will have develop, an amazing development of, of uh, life of different types of microorganisms and, and, and uh, not only microorganisms in the case of the hydrothermal vents are your large eukaryotes. So you would say for example that any naturally occurring environmental life there is no upper limit to the temperature at which life can be found for example. There is an upper limit for, for temperature of course. So are there some environments naturally occurring on earth that are too high a temperature to support life? And well, the magma. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think the highest is 120 degrees, where you can find cells. Thank you very much. Yeah. A, a simpler question. Um, you showed things, uh, um, bits of moisture, I think, in microorganisms on spiders' web. Mm -hmm. Does that mean there were some spiders that well, in that's, your caves? Yeah, there are spiders. Don't ask me how they got there. <laughs> yes, there may be very ancient, I don't know, not thousands of years, but we never saw a spider. But we're not too far from the coast. Yeah, that, yeah. we also asked ourselves that question. How come there is a spider web? You don't see an insect in the Atacama Desert. You know, there is a high road. There is a highway crossing the desert and people comment that it's nice that you don't have any any insects crashing to your shield against your shield when you drive across the desert because there are no insects whatsoever but there was this spider web which gave us a nice paper in extremophiles um all this talk about these tiny things made me think about phages. Mm -hmm. um, if you got, say, a bottle of phages and scattered them on an asteroid or Mars or something, um, would they need anything there that they wouldn't have in order to replicate themselves? Well, phages to replicate need cells. So Do they? Always? Always, yeah, by definition. Yeah. Any virus will require a cell to, to replicate. That's why people argue whether they are alive or not. Okay. Yeah, you, to, have, to, have, to have a reproduction of a phage, you need, you need a cell. Yeah. Okay. And it's not possible that they could figure out how to just, like, replicate themselves using other phages? Or it wouldn't be, cells. well, that would be a different entity that we haven't found. Uh, it, okay. it, it could be possible, but you, you, you need a cell environment to, repro to replicate because the phages, some of them are quite big but they don't have all the genes that are required for reproduction, for, for their own reproduction. Okay. So they need to borrow the machinery from, from cells. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You stated in the beginning that the climate of the Atacama Desert was quite similar to the climate on Mars. If we were to assume that there was life on Mars, even if it was rarer than the life in the Atacama Desert, how long do you think it would be before the technology is <coughs> automated? Like the technology to identify the organisms gets automated enough for us to detect the organisms on Mars. <clears throat> okay, first of all, 
The, the Atacama conditions are similar to Mars, but the, the main difference is the temperature in Mars, which is much uh, colder. No, lower. lower, 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 lower. <laughs> Where is Ignacio? <laughs> there, okay. Okay. Um, so your question is, when do I think that we will be able to identify life in Mars if there is still life in Mars? Is that? Exactly, or traces. Okay, that... The okay, gets in these studies that you can read about in the, in the current issue of, of science, they are studying the conditions, uh, whether, whether they, th these areas that the, the, they are analyzing are habitable or not, okay? Then the, you would have to conduct studies, because we are not bringing samples from there, to, to, that will allow you to reveal whether there is life. And the first experiments uh, run by the Viking, uh, uh, the Viking experiments uh, were designed in such a way to detect any type of metabolism, and they were using radioactivity. And they, 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 the results were not conclusive. I think that we already have the technology already now to, to detect whether there is life now in Mars, but I think that they want to go step by step. Uh, perhaps the first experiments that were done in the 70s uh, uh, were too premature. Uh, there were some other preliminary experiments that were necessary. We, but with respect to life on Mars, uh, this, you did not ask this, but this is just a comment. Because we have to keep in mind this, that Mars has, ne Mars has changed its landscape as, as the Earth has done it. So the, the conditions of Mars, when I mean, there is no question today that there was plenty of water in Mars eons ago, okay? So it perfectly, it could be perfectly that, that life originated in Mars and came to Earth from Mars or originated in both places at the same time. Um, and I can tell you that the scientific community today wouldn't be too surprised if we found life in Mars. We, have, as we could have been 20 years ago, perhaps, astonished. We would be, of course, very excited. But it is not so unexpected anymore to find life else, elsewhere, I think. Uh, um, given the fact that there is... Wait, the mic, the mic. Is... Okay. Given the fact that there is water on Mars, um, do you think it's possible to create an atmosphere on Mars to the point where if, we could in, actually... On Earth, you say? To yeah, replicate think, the conditions on Earth? Yes, in Mars. To replicate the conditions yes. of Earth in Mars? Yes, to create an atmosphere. Of, of we course we could create an atmosphere, yes. Okay. But we have to keep it going, that is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> to maintain it. To maintain it. Um, so I have t two questions mm -hmm. around this, the idea of life on Mars. Uh, one is, uh, am I right to assume that the RNA world hypothesis is still the working hypothesis for the beginning of life? And the, the second question following on from that is, uh, do we have any reason to assume that uh, at some stage Mars had conditions that would be uh, conducive for that sort of environment? Okay, with respect to the second question, that is precisely what the Discovery rover is trying to find out. W what were the conditions in early uh, epochs of, of Mars? Um, and you can date, of course, you can date the place that you are analyzing. Um, and again, this, the, the, in summary, what these studies show that Mars was habitable, which doesn't mean that it was inhabited, but it could, have be, it could have been habited because the conditions were there, according to these studies. Right. So, so my question is not about it being habitable, because as we see, the, the Atacama desert is, is habitable mm -hmm. to some extent. But I doubt that the, that environment would be the one where you would get RNA uh, being able to sort of <laughs> freely float and form cells and things like that. So my question is specific to the origin. Okay, to the origin. Life. So First do, of do all, we know whether it could have started yeah. there? I, I think that the majority of the scientific community favors the RNA world. I, I very humbly disagree with that <laughs> because it is so, you know, I cannot conceive how an RNA molecule can synthesize 
itself and copy itself. There is, there is no way. And I have asked very prominent scientists about this, and they say, come on, Rafael, that's the only hypothesis we have. We have to work with it. And I, I don't agree. It's, tell me, how do you replicate, how do you auto-replicate an RNA? I'm not, I'm to not, ask, here, not, to, I'm not here to defend how it. Do you, how do you make it? I mean, there, the, we have the best labs in the world uh, th throughout, you know, the developed countries. And we have not been able in the, the, this great labs to make RNA abiotically. We cannot do it. Um, but with respect to the conditions to make that RNA or whatever molecule started life, keep in mind that the conditions on Earth were, when life started were completely... You have to imagine, how was Earth when life started? Now we know that there, were, there was liquid, liquid water. We have known that recently, since recently, because uh, we thought that the uh, magma stayed on, on the surface for a long time, but now we know for geologic reasons that there were oceans very early. And now we can understand how is that we can see microfossils that are 3.6 billion years old, because the great bombardment ended uh, 4 billion years ago, and we already have microfossils 3.6 billion years ago, and, and the, when the, how in such a short time frame there, there were cells already. But, but the oceans were formed much earlier. Uh, and, but this is it. Uh, volcanoes, oceans, and clouds, that's it. Uh, no any green color. I mean, you have to imagine how the Earth was when this started. And photosynthesis started, the oxygenic photosynthesis, 2.8 billion years ago. So the Earth was pretty different. And that is something, that is a challenge for us to, to keep in mind that when we think on the, on the primitive Earth, it's something completely different than what we see with our own eyes today. Imagine a lifeless planet, Earth. It's just rocks. It's just like the Atacama Desert to your eyes. So, so uh, if if uh, if we take the RNA world hypothesis out of oh, the, leave it, the way, leave I'll, it, I'll, leave I'll, it. I mean, it could I'll, be yeah, RNA. If, it could be a, a, a other. So, if 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 we if we sort of forget about that, I'll ask you about that later. Mm. But if we forget about that, um, uh, do we have any idea what the what the conditions could have been like when life started? On okay, that? there are several scenarios, and you have supporters for each of them. So you have the the soup. Okay, operating soup in the ocean, and I don't favor that either, and I have reasons for that that I can tell you. And the hydrothermal vents, there are two types of hydrothermal vents, the black smokers that have been worked out, all the prebiotic chemistry pretty well by Wasser Heuser, um, and he has some followers, and I respect him a lot, but I like much more the, the more mild uh, hydrothermal vents, the, the one the, that are called the lost city type, um, because the, you have all types of disequilibrium there, temperature, pH, um, uh, uh, salt concentrations. Um, I like very much the idea that it's been worked by Michael Russell. Um, so you have to think on the deep ocean where you have this water coming from not, not from the magma, that's why the temperature is not so high. Uh, it comes out at 90 degrees with rich salts and um, uh, metals that can catalyze reactions. The, the prebiotic chemistry has been worked out pretty well. That is the theory that I favor most, and that has nothing to do with, with the RNA. It starts with, well, this is not clear in that theory, but it starts with metabolism and, and nucleic acids at the same time. It is so difficult to imagine uh, how can you have metabolism without nucleic acids or how can you have nucleic acids without metabolism. They are so interlinked today. So the big question is how did they start? Well, that is a big question. <laughs> Thank you. I assume what um, the discovery is that we're making pretty much uh, keep confirming the hardihood of life and the longevity of life. Um, and one implication would seem to be that anywhere you could take a rock from Earth, um, 
uh, and it could hit some other object in the solar system, could potentially be a life transmitter. Sure. And are there any limits in, in, in that sense? So if we discover life on Mars, it could really be life on Earth that's, that's been transplanted, for example. We don't have, any, uh, we don't have a, an answer for that question because we have not done the experiments. This, uh, when, we, when I say we, I, I mean the scientific community, OK? Uh, for example, this uh, bug that I showed you that I mentioned, the Deinococcus radiodurans, have been subjected to conditions of a uh, how come it? Sorry. How come it? Sorry. <laughs> um, th there are papers published on uh, Dinococcus radiodurans being subjected to conditions as if it was in a, uh, traveling in a meteor, and it survives. And also, this, some bacteria make spores, for example, and they can, well, I showed you <laughs> That, that uh, halotolerant bacteria survived 250 million years inside a, a salt a crystal. I, I don't see any, I mean, the this distance would be the, the, uh, the limit, I think. But there have been claims, you know, of uh, bacteria coming from Mars. They, and there was a report on science. I would say about Clinton was president because he gave a press conference when this, of course, I mean, there was a paper published in Science showing structures, I saw, uh, I mean, described in this uh, meteorite, AHL something, a meteorite that was found in Allen Hills in Antarctica, and they looked like, like cells, but they were too small. And slowly the scientific community began to, to discard that. And, um, but that could be. It could have started, perhaps the conditions on, on Mars were much more friendly than here to start life, which doesn't solve the problem, how did it start? <laughs> well, so Raphael, that's the question I want to uh, explore with you. We, mm. we can talk about the radical difference of early Earth, but as scientists investigate this very difficult question about the emergence of life on Earth, do they necessarily assume that the emergence is the result of some kind of gradual process, uh, regardless of whether it's a gradual process over a short period of time, over a long period of time? Uh, because if they think it's the result of a gradual process, must they not think that there is some entity which is in some sense not life and in some sense life? And wouldn't that be rather strange? In other words, I'm wondering whether or not the kind of presupposition that we are going to have some sort of transitionary process raises uh, uh, bigger problems than trying to figure out what that process is in the first place. <clears throat> Well, let, let me say something that we all know, that we know nothing, nothing about the original life. And let me tell you a short story, OK? We had a meeting on astrobiology uh, at the headquarters of the Pontifical Academy about five years ago. And Paul Davis was invited to give the keynote lecture, in that, the closing lecture in that meeting. And his lecture wasn't about astrobiology. It was entitled The Origin of Life on Earth. So we asked him throughout the meeting, you know, so what are you going to tell us? What are you going to talk about? And he kept, he kept saying, you will see, you will see. And then he stood up in front of us and he said, OK, I know that you have been waiting for this moment. You all want to know how did life start on Earth. And I have an answer for you. We have no idea. <laughs> so we are not, I am not going to talk about the origin of life on Earth. And he changed subject. <laughs> and he, he described us the bugs that he was isolating from Mono Lake in California, that these uh, cultures that were enriched in, enriched in arsenate. And he published a paper in Science, which wasn't a good paper, claiming that this uh, bacteria grew on arsenate instead of, of phosphorus. OK, this is just to, <laughs> to, to use as an example that we know nothing. There are very many theories. but. OK, so as a scientist, what, what are the choices that you have? You can, we, you know, we know only one type of life which is very, very complex. 
This is highly complex. We don't know of any, I mean, the, the simplest life, which is mycoplasma, is incredibly complex. Okay, so you can, you can perhaps think on simpler forms of life that could have popped out from some environment under certain conditions. But life as we know it, with DNA, RNA, uh, cell structures and so on, cannot start suddenly. And as a scientist, I have to think that it started uh, in steps of increasing complexity. And what is the limit that you would <coughs> define as, a, a, that you would use to define a living entity? Uh, I don't think you will find two people that will agree on that limit. But it has, it, it, it has it had to be through steps, Bill. But the fact that what the way we observe life and its emergence and its change. You like that word, emergence. You like that word. <laughs> we have to be aware of uh, thinking that necessarily the very origin of life is in some way the same, involving the same sort of changes that we observe among living things here. Now, that doesn't mean... No, 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 because you... No, the changes, I mean, life begets life. I mean, the changes that you see is among living entities. I mean, a cell comes from a cell. Okay. But here you have inorganic world coming to organic. That's right. Yeah. And an autosustainable system far from equilibrium. And there must be a threshold for that. And I, I can imagine theoretically a, a, a system of, a, of, a, a, of a organic reactions, for example, uh, that is being auto-sustained, using as an er energy source uh, heat, for example. The question is, I would call that life, or you would call that life. A chemical system that doesn't exist. We, not, we, don't know, we do not know of any chemical system that auto sustains itself far from equilibrium. We have not been able to construct one. But if nature made one, uh, so wh wh when the, do nucleic acids come to come to the to the story? How do you integrate nucleic acid with uh, with metabolism? It's such a big mystery, but it has to be through steps, unless there was a miracle. And as a scientist, a scientist, we have to think with scientific criterion as to an approach. Otherwise, it would be the god of the gaps. Um, do you think it's necessary for a system to be able to sustain itself far from equilibrium? Mm -hmm. Um, what if it could have the good luck of having um, a, a, an environment that just didn't change for long enough for it to become more complex and um, perhaps a little bit more robust? And only after that the environment would change and then it would have to kind of, maybe only a little bit, and it would have to kind of ad adapt its, its mechanism a little bit and on it goes. But if the if the, if the system would change by itself, you mean, to become more robust, that would be a living entity, I think. Okay. I, I don't know if it will reproduce or not, but reproduction to me comes after, uh, after I am aware that I am witnessing a living entity. Reproduction may come much later, because, you know, reproduction is uh, mentioned as a, an essential property of life, but you need to have a live entity to, to reproduce, so you can have life, you can identify life bef before you witness reproduction of that entity. But, well, but that was a different subject, but if, if you want something to evolve uh, in the terms that you were describing, it, it would have to be alive. What's the difference between reproduction and replication? Like say crystals just Good. replicating Good. the same structure Good. over and over. Sometimes they are used interchangeable, uh, interchangeably. Uh, 
I would say that replication is applied more to, to molecules, to macromolecules, and perhaps to crystals. <laughs> but uh, we use reproductions for, for cells. Is, is there any hope of finding forensic molecular evidence uh, which might show the, the stages before RNA and DNA so that we could actually understand how this happened? Yeah, that is a problem. There are no molecular fossils. There are some what people call biosignatures of life. There are some molecules that are very resistant to degradation. Uh, opanoids, I mean, some uh, lipids, for example, but have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, nucleic acids. There are good theories about other type of nucleic acids that would be more stable, for example, with uh, a different sugar, with a different, uh, um, not having the phosphodiester bond, but having an amino acid. Uh, and Stanley Miller was uh, pushing that possibility, and he synthesized the so-called PN PNA, protein nucleic acid, PNA, uh, under abiotic conditions. So th there are now theories about different types of, of nucleic acids, but, but these are just theories. There, there is no proof. But it is conceivable that there could be other type of nucleic acid. Uh, as a molecule carrying genetic information. I mean. just want to ask a quick final question, because when I was at school, I, I read the, the, all these textbooks were telling me that um, we've already worked out how the, the building blocks of life um, have been synthesized, mm -hmm. and there was a bit of hand-waving to suggest the rest is not too difficult a problem. Uh, in the last few decades, do you think we've actually made any progress? Or, or have we just realized how difficult it is? No, we have made progress in terms of uh, synthesizing biomolecules under abiotic conditions. First, under the conditions of, of the soup, operating soup. Uh, then, under the conditions of the uh, hydrothermal vents, the black smokers and the other vents, uh, under different conditions. But there is such a huge step between having the molecules and having a living entity. <laughs> but you have to start from something. So, the the the. As I, there is a recent review uh, of uh, prebi prebiotic chemistry because you have to recall that uh, Stanley Miller did his first experiments in 1953, and that is 60 years ago. So there was a review written for, in, on this occasion. And the progress has been amazing. Uh, how people have managed to find conditions to synthesize all the biomolecules, it, is not, it has not been possible to synthesize timing, timing, one of the bases of, of, of nucleic acids. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the nucleic acid uh, bases were identified in a meteorite a couple of years ago. And the papers published DNA was found. It's not DNA, the nitrogen bases. But still, it's a big surprise to, have, to find nitrogen bases. No, no. We, we know now that the, 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 the biomolecules are not the problem. I mean, space, the cosmos, knows how to make biomolecules, what we call biomolecules, the molecules of life. There are, there, there, there are some huge steps. Uh, for example, why is it that life chose one of the optical isomers only for the sugars and for the amino acids? Because you find in space uh, the two isomers, but in life you find only one. So there is a big question, we have no idea. How did life, why and how did life select a single isomers, isomer? But then, once again, one, one thing is to, have, is to have the biomolecules and then to have life. It's something completely different. Before we thank our speaker, let's just make a brief announcement about our um, second talk of the term, uh, which will be in two weeks' time. And I will be talking, and I'll be talking on the subject of why matter matters, though we live in a materialistic age. The, the concept of matter is a surprisingly difficult one, and I should be looking at it from the point of view of new developments in dynamics. So. Um, uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to just let, uh, ask you to uh, join me in thanking our professor, uh, professor Vicuña for an extraordinary talk this evening. <laughs>